Good morning. We'll try to get everyone uh, the opportunity to get your seats. I'm Scott Silliman. I want to welcome you to this, the 16th consecutive annual conference that we have been putting on here at Duke. And I know several of you uh, have been coming for a number of years, uh, and we're delighted to have you back. I, I must first uh, offer an apology. Uh, this room is not the room that we originally had planned to have this conference in. Uh, for those of you who have been with us before, you know that we have always used what we call the Janine Auditorium, which seats 500 people and has lots of room to stretch and move around. And that is immediately down the hall. We will be in that room tomorrow. Uh, but about uh, two and a half, three weeks ago, uh, we were informed that a uh, Fuqua professor wanted to use that auditorium today. And because uh, we are a law school and not Fuqua, uh, the Fuqua professor got his way. And uh, so we have had to be able to uh, come into this room and we will make do. Uh, we will do everything we can to make your day today in this room as, uh, as convenient and as pleasant as possible. But again, tomorrow's sessions will all be in the Janine Auditorium, which is about 100 feet down the hall. And we'll be moving our registration table uh, down there. Um, I'd like to, uh, I, I guess Charlie's not in the room. I wanted to mention to you that uh, this year, uh, in our Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security, uh, we have a, a new individual who joined us last summer, uh, Charlie Dunlap, a, a visiting professor of the practice of law at Duke University Law School, uh, and also the new associate director of the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. I'm sure you'll meet Charlie uh, during the conference, but uh, he will be taking a dominant role in our center and in these conferences uh, in the years to come. Uh, this year, we're going to be looking at several critical issues facing the Obama administration. We chose this title of looking forward and how is the administration going to be dealing with issues such as indefinite detention, which is going to be our first panel this morning, airport security, cyber. Uh, we're also, of course, going to be having meal speakers talking to us during the conference uh, about what is the condition in the what we call the Arab Spring and what's going to be the end state. That's our luncheon speaker uh, today. And then we're going to be talking about the terrorist threat tonight at dinner. Uh, and then tomorrow uh, we're going to be having John Noggle talking to us about Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, what do we do as far as engagement or disengagement uh, in that region of the world? Uh, speaking of the meals, if you have not already signed up to join us at either today's lunch or tonight's dinner or tomorrow's lunch, then we still have tickets available out at the registration desk. We will be structuring this conference as we normally have, again, with six theme panels, three today uh, and three tomorrow. Uh, I have asked all the panel moderators to ensure, absolutely ensure, that there is at least 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the hour and 45 minute period to allow you to talk to the panelists, to allow you to ask questions, uh, to offer comments. So in that respect, there will be two of these wireless microphones that the ladies right here, Joy Dunlop and my wife Bev, will be having. And if you have a comment or a question that you would like to pose to one of the panelists, please just raise your hand and wait for the ladies to bring you this wireless mic. The reason is we always have a total audio-visual record of these conferences, which we post on the Duke Law website for researchers to come in and look at after the conference. And so we want to make sure that we have your comments and questions recorded for posterity. So if, you'd, if you have a comment or a question, if you can wait for the ladies uh, to bring you the handheld mic. Uh, for the attorneys present, uh, particularly if you want CLE, we have been approved for 10 and a half hours of CLE credit by the North Carolina uh, Bar Association and the forms are out there uh, at the registration desk. You've been given a packet of materials uh, in that blue folder and one of the pieces of paper in that packet is an evaluation form. Uh, I will guarantee you that we try to make these conferences better every year. We read them and try to accommodate uh, any comments. So if there's anything that you can put on that form that will help us make these conferences better, we encourage you to do it. And we encourage you to do it as the conference proceeds rather than 
wait until the end and then drop the registration or the uh, evaluation form uh, at the registration desk. Uh, also, if there is anything that any of us can do to make your stay with us today and tomorrow better, uh, more enjoyable, please see either Charlie, by the way, I mentioned Charlie Dunbap uh, in the back before our new associate director. Charlie, raise your hand so everyone knows who you are. Uh, if, if you could see either Charlie or me or any of the ladies out at the registration desk, uh, we'd very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to help you in any way we can. Uh, so I'm going to step away from the podium and now turn our conference program over to my colleague Bobby Chesney from the University of Texas, a law professor, and he's going to be moderating our first panel on indefinite detention. Bobby? Thank you very much, Scott. It's an honor and a pleasure to be back here at this conference. Uh, it's, it's the, I think, the premier event of its type every year, um, not to be missed, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to participate in it. As, as Scott said, and as you know from the materials, our panel is on the topic of detention without criminal charge and its relationship to terrorism. It's a topic of perennial interest and of interminable, it seems, debate. Uh, it's a topic that probably could show up and probably has shown up on the program of this conference and other conferences like it year in and year out for going on the better part of a decade now. But it's never the same discussion because the topic is not one that's simply being replowed again and again. Rather, uh, we, it's like peeling back an onion. We keep finding new layers of complexity and difficulty, um, new issues emerging, new policy developments, and it somehow manages to remain fresh over time. And not just fresh, but of, of great national significance and, and certainly of great national interest. Um, now, by way of background to orient us to the topic, not that we necessarily need it with something quite so familiar, but nonetheless, prior to 9-11, the United States did not employ military detention without criminal charge in relation to terrorism. Right? It wasn't a central tool or, or a tool that was used in the counterterrorism context. What did we do? Well, obviously, we did prosecute. Prosecution, civilian prosecution, was a, a central tool that we employed. Uh, it wasn't always possible to use that tool, and it wasn't the only tool we were using in the pre-9-11 period. We also used lethal force on occasion. The occasions in which it was possible to do that and thought desirable to do that were limited. But if you think, for example, to 1998 and the aftermath of the East African Embassy bombings, the initial response was a lethal military force response. Frequently, combinations of considerations such as diplomatic possibilities, available intelligence, domestic political considerations, whatever they might be, did not make that a desirable or available option. And in those circumstances, there were other tools that were used in that period. For example, relying on or prevailing upon our allies, our, our liaison services in other countries to, to incapacitate individuals who we were deemed to be of terrorism threat interest. Uh, and in some instances, facilitating their efforts to do this by uh, rendering people into their custody. All these tools were used in various ways prior to 9-11. What was different after 9-11, conceptually, when it comes to incapacitating suspected terrorists, was the introduction, was, was of course the matter of scale in terms of using those other tools I just mentioned. But in terms of new tools, the new tool was non-criminal military detention. Now, this began when the first detainees began to come into U.S. custody in late 2001. But from the beginning, it was clear that we weren't really talking about just one detention policy or one set of questions. There were always many woven in together at the same time. If you think about it, this is, this is rather obvious. So if you think about the large-scale U.S. military intervention in Afghanistan in the fall of 2001, and the fact that eventually we began to come into custody of people <coughs> in Afghanistan, captured in Afghanistan, where, where all the features of the fact pattern were war in Afghanistan centric. That's one set of issues, and the detention associated with those captures 
pose their own questions. But it's, it's an entirely different and more complicated set of questions when you simultaneously also begin to come into custody of and use detention with respect to persons captured elsewhere in circumstances not directly linked to Afghanistan where large-scale combat operations are going on, but instead maybe in a, a country where there is no combat at all going on, but the reason for the detention is, is, a, is a claim of al-Qaeda membership. That introduces its own set of issues, even if some of those persons end up routed back into Afghanistan for custody. Well, that draws our attention to this underlying question of what, is, what are the legal boundaries and what are the legal foundations of detention, bearing in mind the complexity of these different streams of detention. And that's, of course, just the beginning of the conversation. Many, many other questions began to emerge, and most of them have been with us ever since, uh, even if constantly evolving. There's the question of what status detainees are entitled to. What is their legal status? Is someone entitled to POW status? Are they entitled to protected person status? If it's a non-international armed conflict, what labels, if any, do you, do you apply? Uh, questions of process. What sort of screening, procedural rules, evidentiary rules, and so forth. Uh, what must exactly take place in making these status determinations and making the decision to detain in the first place? Conditions of confinement and interrogation conditions. Judicial review, the involvement of Article III courts in all of this. Questions of transferring and releasing individuals. All of these raise their own interconnected set of issues. And incredibly, though we are approaching the point where we are a full decade into the experience of dealing with detention without criminal charge in the counterterrorism context, not that many of these questions have even come close to producing consensus answers at this point. To be sure, we know a few things. We know that federal courts have habeas jurisdiction over detainees who are held at Guantanamo. There are other things that are settled, but there's a whole lot more that remains deeply contested, and we're going to have ample opportunity now to talk about this with a, a really fantastic panel. I'm, I'm really pleased with um, the fact that these three gentlemen were willing to, to join us today. I, if it's all right with you guys, uh, I'll say a few words quickly about the format, and then I'll do very brief introductions. The format we agreed upon in advance was that after I uh, did my obligatory ramblings here for the first few minutes, I would uh, give each of the three panelists just five minutes to say their piece about some particular set of things that may be of interest to them under this heading. But very quickly, we're going to move into a moderated dialogue. And we've batted about some questions and topics that we think would be of interest. And I'm going to use the bulk of the time, in, rather than having long set piece presentations, actually have a discussion where we'll try to make it as lively and engaging as possible. And we're going to try to range over a lot of what, what the four of us take to be some of the, the cutting edge issues, rather than uh, reworking some of the more uh, well-plowed fields. And then, of course, as is the tradition here, we'll preserve as much time as possible so that you can join the conversation, either picking up the thread of the conversation that we've been having or taking it in new directions as you see fit. So um, without further ado, I think the sequence will be, I think it probably makes the most sense to go Ben, Mike, Trevor. Is that agreeable to you guys? Uh, so Ben Wittes will go first. Ben is, all three people here should be familiar figures to anyone who follows this debate. Ben is with Brookings, and Ben is, I would say, uh, <coughs> among, if not the most prominent commentator and observer of, of the development, and certainly the, the savviest observer of developments in the realm of detention law and policy over the past 10 years. Um, he's the author of several books, uh, most recently, Detention and Denial. If you've not got a copy of or haven't heard of his book, Detention and Denial, it's relatively hot off the presses. It is a fascinating and challenging and provocative read. And as all things Ben writes, it's very enjoyable to read as well. Um, whether you agree or disagree with him, uh, his arguments <coughs> need to be taken account of. And so I, I commend you that book. I also commend his, his other prior writings, including Law and the Long War and, uh, and, and uh, some reports. I, I, won't, I won't recommend the stuff that we co-authored. That seems unseemly. <laughs> I'll just leave that out. Uh, Mike Gottlieb uh, is, is recently returned to the United States after service in Afghanistan as the deputy commander and, and the top, I believe, the top civilian official within uh, Task Force 435. Um, it's unique and rare to have someone with his particular experience uh, to appear at a conference of this kind. Uh, a truly unique perspective on 
the place where all this talk of detention law and policy uh, meets the road, where the rubber meets the road, and where, where you have to find that interface between uh, abstract discussions of law and policy and the actual implementation of detention in a combat zone. And definitely not last but not least, Trevor Morrison of Columbia, law professor at Columbia, uh, also recently returned to civilian life uh, from uh, the White House Counsel's Office where uh, Trevor played significant roles and had a hand in, in many of these debates as they developed uh, internally. And also uh, recently returned uh, from a far briefer stint, but nonetheless a, a period of, of visiting and observing detention operations in Afghanistan as well and, and having a, a per firsthand perspective on these things. So I would, I would say we've got uh, as good a set of perspectives as we're going to be able to assemble. And so I'll stop talking now and I'll turn it over to Ben. Thanks, Bobby, for the kind words in the introduction. Um, I want to going to speak very briefly. I want to make two points. The first is about tails and dogs in this debate and which wag which. Um, detention, is a detention policy is a very big dog. And it is being wagged by three very small tails. And I, I think the, the, the first point I'd like to make, I'd like to bring out what those three tails are and try to cut them off because I think they actually distract a lot of attention from, the real, from what should be the focus of the real discussion. The first, the first tail that wags the dog is, is what you might think of as the per se question of detention. We have this very earnest debate in Washington. You know, should we be doing detention? Is, is indefinite detention you know, consistent with American values? Um, should we you know, get rid of it and charge everybody that we can't release? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, there's no polite way to say this. This entire conversation is irrelevant. Um, all three branches of government agree that we are going to be engaged in some form of non-criminal detention for all of the rest of our lifetimes. Um, the Supreme Court has, has, has acknowledged as much. Um, the executive branch under as conservative an administration as we're likely to see in, in the near future and as liberal an administration as we're likely to see as in, in the near future, um, both uh, assert the authority to detain people um, outside of the criminal justice system. And Congress, the only question is whether Congress will push for more detention authority, not less. And so as a practical matter, this is, this is a decided issue um, that the public debate simply has not caught up with. Um, so the second tale that wags the dog, you might call the where question for detention. Um, the question of whether we should do it at Guantanamo Bay or at somewhere else. And this is a, a, a profoundly unimportant question <laughs> that dominates the entire discussion. Um, I, I, I think it, it's really worth saying up front that, that Guantanamo Bay is a, is, a, is a military base, it's a naval base, not profoundly unlike other naval bases, um, except with a peculiar jurisdictional quirk that um, I, there is no good reason why the question that we argue about so earnestly should be whether to close it, um, rather than the question <coughs> of actually what the substance of our detention policy ought to look like. The third tail that wags the dog, and this is actually a, a, an important question in its own right, but it's not, it shouldn't dominate the detention conversation, is the question of who, if anyone, and in what forum you are going to bring to criminal trial. Um, now, as I say, this is an important question. Um, what trial format you're going to use, what, whether you're going to, going to use federal courts, or military commissions or some alternative tribunal. I do not mean to diminish the importance of this question. It affects a rounding error numerically of the people that we are going to hold um, and need to neutralize by detaining for some period of time, whether long or short, in counterterrorism operations. To give you an idea of what I mean when I say it's a rounding error, I think I learned from Bobby's paper uh, uh, some time back that over the course of detention operations in, in, in Iraq, 
um, U.S. forces had held at 1.70,000 people. Um, so, you know, we're talking about, uh, the people we're talking about bringing to trial from Guantanamo, the, the Guantanamo task force um, identified 36 as potential um, subjects of criminal trial in one forum or another. So you're not, you know, even if you resolved that issue in the way that was most satisfactory to wh whoever you happen to be as, a, as an analyst, it doesn't remotely affect the larger question of, of what sort of detention policies you will and will not need. Um, the, so I, I, all of those is to say these are the questions that we should not be focused on. And let me then turn to the question that we should be focused on. And that is not whether you're going to do detention, not where you're going to do detention, and not when you're going to do criminal trial instead of detention. But what are the rules for detention going to be? Who are you going to detain? Um, what, what processes are you going to use in order to um, determine whom you're going to detain? What rights do people have in those processes? What role, if any, and when and at what stage of the process do the federal courts have in reviewing detentions? These are actually the vibrant, ongoing questions that are being worked on in an ongoing basis in Congress to, a left, to the least extent in the courts in a very feverish way and in the executive branch in a very ongoing and granular way. And so um, that's the broadly speaking the first point I would like to make. The second point is a very discrete point related to the word indefinite which is, shows up in the title of this um, panel. Um, indefinite detention is often used as a synonymous with endless. Um, and this is um, understandable um, for historical reasons, but it's actually wrong. And it's important to focus on the actual literal meaning of that word because it, it actually better describes than what we, what we tend to think of as, as synonymous with it, the way American detention policy actually works. The word indefinite means lacking a definite endpoint. It does not mean having no endpoint. Um, and in fact, most US detentions in counterterrorism cases are relatively short term, not long term. Um, and the number of people, for example, just at Guantanamo, there have been about 800 people who've passed through Guantanamo. About 170 are still there. So that gives you an idea that if for, for the vast majority of people, um, and, and that's even truer in theater detention operations about which everybody on this panel is more qualified to talk than I. Um, the, but the point is, when you say indefinite detention, you should not have in your mind the idea that that means this person is locked up for the rest of his life. You should have in your mind the idea that of, of a detention system that is more flexible than the criminal system in terms of entry into it and entry out of it, and has a different set of processes associated with both. So I'm going to stop there and uh, uh, stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. It's um, great to be here today. This is a, a great privilege to be on a panel with these uh, three experts. Uh, I would not consider myself an expert in detention uh, law or policy, but rather somebody who implemented it on the ground for the last 14 months in Afghanistan and uh, serving in a place and in a command where the profoundly unimportant question of where was in fact quite important uh, to those of us who were interacting with the government of Afghanistan regularly about issues such as the presence of third country nationals in their country. Um, so we may have a discussion about uh, whether we agree that that question of where is profoundly unimportant. For those of us operating in theater, it was a profoundly important question uh, as the possibility of long-term uh, detention in Afghanistan unrelated uh, to that conflict hung over our heads for the uh, entire time of my service there. Um, one of the great things about doing theater detention operations, uh, as opposed to having to deal with uh, the thorny issues at Guantanamo, is that we did not operate under the same microscope, uh, under the same political pressures that people who were dealing with uh, detentions at Guantanamo had to deal with. We had a much uh, 
higher volume of detainees coming in and going out. Nothing like Iraq, uh, where I believe that the high water mark was around 27,000 held at one time. Uh, the high water mark for Afghanistan thus far is around 1,600. When I got there, it was around 650. So a much smaller population. Uh, my command, uh, Joint Task Force 435, was a three-star command, meaning we were led by a, a three-star uh, Navy admiral just under General Petraeus. So we're operating at a very high level in the theater, a lot of resources, a lot of people, not that many detainees. So if we can't get detention policy right, with, uh, with, uh, with those kinds of resources and with that sort of small population set, given what we had to deal with, then we can't get it right anywhere. That gave us the opportunity to really experiment uh, with a lot of different changes to the procedures, the, the question of how. Uh, and so over the course of the 14 months I was there, we made a lot of changes to how we reviewed detainee cases, to how we structured detainee review boards, to how we released individuals. <coughs> how we attempted to reintegrate detainees back into their community, how we tracked them uh, to try to combat the problem or the perceived problem of recidivism. And I would argue that it's more perceived than real, uh, at least in the Afghan theater. Um, so that gave us a great opportunity to really try out a bunch of different uh, changes on the ground in the theater and to do it uh, all the while while operating with a government that was keenly interested uh, in everything that we were doing uh, in the detention, uh, in the intention realm. Uh, the main mission of our task force during the time that I was there was to work ourselves out of a job, uh, essentially to uh, transition detention operations and everything associated with them to the government of Afghanistan over a period that began under General McChrystal as a one-year period, and when General Petraeus came in, that sort of slowly grew to a two-year or perhaps a four-year period, conditions-based uh, always being the, the relevant modifier. Uh, to our need to transition. Um, and so we had to not only uh, answer the question of where for the government of Afghanistan to provide them a place uh, to do their detention, but we also had to engage with the Afghan government in the, in the, the very difficult questions of how. And so while we'll talk uh, for most of today about detentions under the law of armed conflict, uh, as uh, informed by a long debate in our courts uh, in the D.C. Circuit and, under, and in our executive branch. In Afghanistan, they're talking about something completely different, which is incapacitating terrorists and insurgent threats under their constitution and under their criminal procedure code. And so we have spent uh, a year trying to figure out how you do that. How is it that you transition from a bunch of guys being held under the laws of armed conflict, being processed through detainee review boards under Depar Department of Defense policy into a system where a host government is actually going to prosecute uh, individuals under its criminal laws, criminal procedures, and its constitution. And uh, a host of very, very difficult challenges associated with that that I think we may uh, get into in discussion um, later today. Um, and I think with that, I'll, I'll, I won't talk more. I'll turn it over to, uh, to Trevor. To Great. Uh, well, let me also uh, echo uh, the thanks. I'm, I'm uh, very glad to be here with you and, uh, and really honored to be um, with these uh, three fine folks on this panel. Um, it, as the one last to go with my introductory <laughs> remarks, I, I, I agree with so much of what's already been said, even the points of disagreement, which is to say that I just think there are some things about which you, you can see it two different ways, and I sort of agree with both Mike and Ben, even on work, even when they're disagreeing with one another, um, uh, that I won't that I, uh, I, I just which uh, reflects a certain schizophrenia on my part, I suppose. But they, I, I won't I won't add a whole lot. Just just a couple of points. One is very much to agree with the first thing that Ben said. I think um, that a question of uh, detention under the law of war, if you want to call it indefinite detention, bracketing the 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 sort of some difficulties with that particular word, is today in the United States a question of how and how much, not whether. Uh, it, has, it is not the case that the public debate has fully caught up with that. Um, and it's an interesting question exactly why that might be so, but it's sort of remarkable how much one sees, say, even responsible mainstream journalism talking about lawless detention um, at Guantanamo. And I frankly don't know what that means. It might, it might, I guess it means that the author 
of that, of that point of view, thinks that the law ought to be understood to mean something other than what it has been authoritatively said to mean in our system. But if one pays attention to what all three branches of government, including the Supreme Court, in its uh, exercising its uh, power of final review over the questions that do come before it, uh, there is uh, legal authority to engage in this sort of detention. Um, that doesn't mean that any use of it is necessarily legal, but it means uh, the hard legal questions are about the boundaries of this authority. I think hard questions arise with respect to time. Um, the, the longer these detentions become, the more analogies to detention of this sort in past armed conflicts come under strain. Um, and so there are questions about scope, but not about whether or not. Uh, I do think that it might be the case that part of the reason the public debate hasn't caught up with that is connected to the sort of closed Guantanamo or not debate. I suspect that some who, when, when they would engage or hear about the debate about whether to close Guantanamo, took closing Guantanamo to mean abandoning this form of detention. Um, and I think many others, and I'll put myself in the, in the second group, didn't think that that necessarily followed, that there could be an argument for closing Guantanamo as a detention facility because its use as a particular facility and sort of the costs were, uh, were outweighing the benefits, but that closing the facility doesn't mean abandoning or concluding that it is illegal to engage in that kind of detention. But I think the public debate was um, insufficiently careful on that point. Uh, and so there's a sort of set of expectations with respect to the, the illegality or the categorical undesirability of this form of detention that just doesn't match up with either where the law is or where practice is or is likely to be. Um, on the where question, this point of disagreement, how, how important is the where question, I think the way I would put that is one hard question when talking about this is, is it right to think that you can talk about indefinite detention broadly speaking. It, I think it is right to say the hard questions are what sort of policy should inform this? What are the legal rules, both in terms of substantive detention authority, judicial review, and non-judicial review are the sort of categories that I think of from a law and policy perspective. But one can take the where out of it as significant if you say you ought to just kind of address that question for indefinite <coughs> detention generally. But that might not be the right way to think about it. It might be that the kind of detention that goes on in Afghanistan that Mike's been talking about and the kind of detention that continues at Guantanamo and then the kind of detention even under military authorities that might, that has existed and might potentially exist again within the United States if someone captured within the United States. And then again the detention of someone who is captured either by U United States or some other country and turned over to US custody in some other part of the world that's not a hot battlefield. The, the, uh, what distinguishes those different cases is more significant than what they have in common. So that those are four or five different conversations and if they are, what separates them among other things is the where point. Um, I think it's my sense that the Obama administration at least, as it talked about this question publicly at least in the first year of the administration, uh, took a position that the debate was about Guantanamo was separable from the debate about this form of detention sort of anywhere else in the world. And so where was an important dividing line? And that the legal rules and the rules for judicial review and other kinds of review, the way you would answer those questions for Guantanamo um, should not be thought necessarily to have consequences for how you would answer those questions in Afghanistan or somewhere else. And I don't today want to defend as correct or, or criticize as incorrect that point of view, but I want to lay it on the table. It might be that a way in which the where matters is that um, the dissimilarities in detention operations from both a legal and policy <laughs> perspective as you move from one where to another where are more significant than the similarities. Uh, and then you'd have to sort of recognize that you're having a bunch of different debates, not one overarching one. Um, let me just make one other, uh, and, and I, guess, I guess I feel the same way about the trial point. Um, depending on what the denominator is, the total population that you're talking about, it's, it's the case that any prosecution option is vanishingly insignificant compared to the total population of detainees. If you, if you look at sort of global US military detention operations, if, on the other hand, you said, well, I'm going to separate out, I'm going to have a series of different conversations, then prosecution as a disposition option becomes still, I think, right, the presumptive one 
for people who are arrested or captured within the United States. Uh, and so if you focus just on that piece of it, or for people who are, uh, you know, I think you'd have to say prosecution is a very significant option that we do by way of extradition, right, when someone is arrested in another country that's not a hot battlefield. Um, so again, I think it's sort of, it's right to say that trial is vanishingly insignificant as a disposition option if you're, if you're including the 70,000 people ultimately who were ever detained uh, in, in Iraq. But if you focus on a subpopulation, then uh, the trade-off between non-criminal detention and trial becomes a much more central piece of the debate. Um, and so one has to sort of make decisions about what you're, what you're talking about before knowing what the relevant options are. The one thing I'll say as a substantive point is that a, a significant thing to me about how the Obama administration has worked detention operations thus far, and that does distinguish it from at least the early years of the Bush administration, is what I would call non-unilateralism. Um, the position with respect to detention authority that the Obama administration has taken is that the only detention authority it is formally defending in court is authority conferred by Congress through the AUMF. It's an incredibly textually spare authorization, obviously, that doesn't even contain the word detention. But the point is then it's revisable by Congress. And a lot of, of course, what Congress has had to say in this area has not been stuff that the administration has been terribly happy to hear, like the statutory restrictions put on transfer of Guantanamo detainees. But the administration continues to operate within those statutory boundaries rather than to try and make arguments that the president has some unilateral constitutional authority to override those statutory limits. What that means is sort of underscoring the first point that Ben began with. All three branches are seized of this issue in one way or another. And what this administration is doing, I think the hallmark across all of its operations is a kind of non-unilateralism. There can be good debates about whether Congress should do more and legislate more specifically or not. Um, but one thing that I think is worth keeping in mind is that the approach that this government has right now is, is not one of trying to assert a kind of inherent, unregulable executive power to make decisions in this area, but instead to operate within boundaries that are by and large set by Congress, uh, with the courts speaking at least some of the time to some of the detentions. Ben, you wanted to respond? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to make a couple of quick, cla cla a quick clarifying comment. Um, you know, I, I think the actual apparent disagreement between me and, and, and Mike at the outset is, is more apparent than real. And it may be because I, I it, it may be because I'm uh, rather overstated what I meant to say. My, my point is not that the where question is, is unimportant in general. It's that the, the where question is unimportant. It, the, the, we have tended to focus a huge amount of the energy of this debate on the question of whether or not we should continue to detain people at Guantanamo Bay, as opposed to <coughs> debating the parameters of the detention authority that one should have with respect to those people and others like them. I think this is a very unimportant question. Um, and it dominates, it doesn't dominate the world of discussion of these issues when you're in Afghanistan doing detention operations on the ground. But when, you're, when you live in Washington and you get you know, the, the average call from the average journalist um, has to do with, you know, it's now one year and 14 days since President Obama missed his close <laughs> Guantanamo deadline. This has, I mean, it has a, a completely outsized effect on, on the debate. So with, with the caveat that, that I think that question is deeply unimportant and we should all stop discussing it, I yield to everything that Mike said about the importance of the where question at, at, in, in, in theater operations. Um, I also wanted to say one very quick thing about the denominator of the, uh, of the expression question that Trevor just raised, because I think that, that's a very important point. And you know, when you, the, 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 the point that, I, that I'm trying to make about both the where issue and the, uh, and the criminal trial issue is not, you know, is, n is not that you, you shouldn't subdivide these questions and make very specific policy judgments as to different corners of the detention issue. The point is that none of those subdivisions that you can do gets you around the point that we are going to be detaining people, sometimes in small numbers, sometimes in large numbers, for 
a long time to come and that we're going to be holding people for, in some cases, for very long periods of time. And there's a tendency to say, well, we can treat Guantanamo as a legacy problem and we can, you know, we can, you know, rely on a certain degree of invisibility for theater, certain theater operations. And my, my point is, none of that gets you around um, the fact that you do need ultimately a set of rules or a lot of different sets of rules. Um, none of them will get you around the problem of detention. So now we enter the talk show portion of the evening. So <laughs> at risk of falling off the podium, I will turn my, my chair here. And, uh, and, and although I had you know, shown you in advance the questions I wanted to ask, I'm actually motivated to ask something else in light of stuff that you have said in your introductory remarks. Um, you know, Trevor had mentioned just now the, uh, the aversion to unilateralism and the, the reliance on the AUMF as the, as the domestic source of detention authority. Mike had talked about the process of trying to transfer detention responsibility shifted over to the Afghans over time. And one need only look at our experience in Iraq over time to appreciate that however long they may drag on, our overseas combat deployments and resulting detention systems that spring up around them, they're never permanent things. Mm -hmm. the, these are finite things. And eventually, however hard it is to imagine right now, or perhaps not that hard, uh, combat operations in Afghanistan really, not just in name and formality, that's a separate topic, but they'll really end. Uh, bearing all this in mind, it raises the question of whether this administration or some future administration will need something more than what they have in the September 18th, 2001 AUMF. Is there, well, do we need a new AUMF? That's the question. Is it something we need now? Is it something we're going to need down the road? So um, in no particular order, anyone who wants to jump on that one. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and give an answer that rather than answering that question directly, uh, suggests what you, might, <laughs> what you might think about in trying to answer that question. A second order question, right, answer exactly. is fine. Law professor's occupational hazard. Um, so, and, and, and the reason I want to come at it that way is it seems to me that uh, many, not all, but many who, who have a strong view in favor or against arguments for new legislation have a particular concept of what the legislation that they either strongly favor or strongly oppose would be. Um, but it's not fixed, right, what that legislation might be. There are a whole lot of different things. One very difficult thing to me about the sort of kind of quasi-stalemate or game of chicken that's going on in Washington over <coughs> the new legislation question right now is that there isn't a threshold agreement on the set of things that might be addressed by legislation if legislation is taken up in this area. So one thing that it could address is substantive detention authority, which is what Bobby is focusing on. Um, and or, right, it could start specifying process by statute. So the many that, maybe all of the bills that have been introduced, or at least many of the ones that have been introduced since the uh, administration's uh, executive order announcing follow-up review, effectively internal to the executive branch, follow-up review after habeas is over for the Guantanamo detainees, these bills sort of set some statutory rules for what that kind of follow-up review is allowed to look like or not. So it could be process of that sort. It could be greater specification of what habeas should look like. The court in Boumidian acknowledged that it was answering virtually none of the questions about what this constitutional privilege to habeas would actually look like as applied in the lower courts. And you know, reading maybe not so much between the lines or even just the lines of the opinion itself, the court effectively said you know, the district courts can work that out. Um, but another thing that could happen is that Congress could specify. Congress could, for example, legislate um, a kind of statutory mechanism for how to treat classified information in, in the habeas setting, right? SEPA, the statutory framework that applies in federal criminal trials, doesn't apply to zone terms in, in habeas. So you could have that. There could be other extraneous things. Congress could start you know, dictating uh, uh, by statute you know, an exception or expansion of the public safety exception to the Miranda requirements, right? Now, there's been now, uh, we know publicly there's a kind of executive branch position on that generated out of the FBI, but that could be part of legislation. So then saying yes, there ought to be legislation or no, there ought not to be sort of can, I think can only be spoken of by saying there ought to be legislation of this sort 
And one problem from a practical perspective in Washington is that it's hard to stake out a position and say we're going to go seek this legislation because just seeking legislation can start a ball rolling and you don't know what ultimately will be sort of tagged onto the, the, the ultimate product. And at least in the area of habeas, when Congress has legislated with respect to habeas in the recent past, it hasn't been in the, so much in the executive detention area as in the post-conviction area, the result has not been greater clarity in the law. The result <laughs> has been a, a literal cottage <laughs> industry of post-conviction habeas litigation whose entire point is to lit litigate over the ambiguities created by the new statute that Congress passed. That's the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Or in the immigration context too, what Congress did in that statute and the uh, Legal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act, IRA, IRA. IRA, IRA. Um, and so one possibility is that even though statutory reform might be aimed at giving greater clarity, it might actually have a perverse consequence and create greater ambiguity. All that said, I think that for me, the best argument for new legislation would be not to expand detention authority necessarily, because I don't know that we have an operational need to do that at this point. But I do think, given the length of some of the detentions that are, that are ongoing, that from a kind of democratic accountability perspective, uh, legislative confirmation that Congress agrees with the executive branch and its theory of the scope of detention authority that it's saying it has right now in its so-called March 13th definition and its filing in the habeas cases, I think from a kind of just democratic accountability perspective would be good and it might give courts greater comfort in continuing to rely on that definition because it had a kind of updated ratification. Even there though, I think probably the argument for that was stronger a year ago than now because the trajectory of the litigation in the DC courts at the DC circuit level is not one of a terribly high degree of discomfort on the part of the judges <laughs> with applying that understanding of detention authority. Um, and I don't think operationally there is yet established a need to expand that detention authority and I think we really don't know how to do the constitutional analysis of how far Congress could go there. These debates in Washington are often about, well, maybe Congress should grant just broader detention authority. The court in Hamdi gave us no analytical <coughs> guidance as to how to identify what, if any, constitutional limit there might be on what detention authority Congress can grant. Um, that's a question courts would have to confront if Congress expanded detention authority by statute. And here I very much agree with something Justice Kennedy said at the end of his Boumediene opinion, which is that we've gotten by for about two centuries with the courts not having had to identify the outer boundaries of the war power, and that that's a good thing, in part because the courts are ill-equipped to do it, but they might be obliged to do it if they're forced to. And I think it's, uh, an, until an operational need is shown, I don't think we should go that way. Mike? Yeah, the only thing I'd, I'd really add to that is that um, Obviously, the AUMF is uh, a 9-11 focused statutory authorization. So as combat evolves, um, you do find yourself uh, in sometimes sort of difficult situations trying to apply that. And so in Afghanistan, for example, um, some of the groups against whom our troops now fight, if we're being honest, uh, have absolutely nothing to do with 9-11 and under no rational argument could. Um, there are people who have come to the fight, in fact, groups that have formed after uh, September 11, 2001. And so we find ourselves uh, occasionally put in an awkward position if we're being, trying to be very careful lawyers about what the domestic statutory authorization for our detention authority is. That said, as a sort of predictive judgment, I don't think we're going to see uh, anytime soon a revision of that statutory detention authority because it's incredibly costly uh, from a political in a political sense to enact legislation in this area. There's a reason that we don't have a more uh, detailed and specific <laughs> detention law now, and it's because it's, it's an area on which it's very hard to get people to agree, and it's, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a highly followed issue, it's a highly charged issue, um, and it's one that's, that becomes politicized the instant it's discussed. So I think that the, the only way you're going to see a revision to the, the statutory authority is if the interchange between the executive uh, and, the, uh, and the courts forces, uh, forces that kind of a change to take place. And as Trevor uh, correctly points out, the trajectory of, of cases uh, in the DC circuit uh, on habeas and, and the sort of the likely direction of the Supreme Court if the issue comes back to it uh, 
is not one that I think is going to force the executive's hand on this issue in the foreseeable future. Um, I actually not sure I agree with that. I, I, I'm not sure I don't, but um, I, I think there's a um, reasonable chance that there will be legislation this year. And um, I think it will, and the, the mechanism for it is the following. The new chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Buck McKeon, um, has A, said very clearly that he wants to legislate the framework here, and B, was uh, very offended um, by the administration's proceeding with an executive order on uh, uh, review for Guantanamo detainees without proceeding legislatively. He's introduced legislation, and my best read on it is that he seems serious about it. Um, now, the problem is that the legislation that he's introduced, and we can go into the details if people are interested, the legislation that he's introduced has some provisions that are, you, you know, will be wildly unacceptable to the administration and would be wildly unacceptable to any other executive branch administration as well. And so if you imagine the situation in which he pursues legislation along those model uh, along that line, um, I, I think there's, that will force a degree of administration engagement um, over the terms, uh, what, what legislation it can and can't tolerate in, in this area. And the recent history when Congress has done that sort of thing, which generally with respect to transfers um, from Guantanamo, is that we have emerged with legislation. And so I, I think the fact that really for the first time you have a, a significant um, committee chairman of a relevant committee of jurisdiction uh, who's um, interested in legislating, has put something on the table, um, I, I actually think the administration would ignore that at its peril with respect to what's likely to emerge over the next nine to nine to twelve months. Let, let me say, I, uh, ever since Bush versus Gore, I've tried to get out of the prognostication business. So I, <laughs> uh, I didn't mean to be taking a position on whether legislation is likely, but it seems to me that what Ben says um, seems quite plausible. There, there is, as he, as he notes, uh, now introduced legislation, not just introduced by, uh, by the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, but uh, bills on the Senate side as well that are sort of companions to it. Um, and it seems hard to predict. Uh, the, I guess the normative question is if there's to be new legislation, what should it say? I think Mike's quite right too that um, there are difficulties applying uh, force authorization that, that was so immediately and appropriately responsive to the 9-11 attacks, to an armed conflict that's you know, now uh, a decade old at least, um, depending on how you figure when it began. Um, uh, just one other note, one, one thing Congress could do in clarifying, if it were to pass, not dramatically changing the scope of detention authority, but sort of clarifying its agreement with where the government roughly is on this, is it could address a question about whether that detention authority is appropriately read, the, the, the authority conferred by the AUMF, against the backdrop of mm -hmm. relevant principles drawn from the international law of war. Um, that's the position of the Obama administration. It was the position rejected by the panel of the DC Circuit in the, in the Bahani case, and that rejection then kind of turned into dicta maybe by a majority of the judges uh, in, in the course of denying the petition for rehearing re on Bonk in that case. My own view on this is that I, I think the debate, even among the judges in that case, was, was somewhat curiously narrow. There seems to be a sense in which sort of having recourse to these principles drawn from the international law of war, not that they applied directly of their own force, but a presumption that Congress meant to sort of incorporate them, right, into the, into the legislative authorization necessarily entails a narrowing of the authority. I don't think that's right. It can entail some narrowing, but it's actually, and this is why I was put in mind of it, it's through those principles that you can, you can generate a justification for being able to use AUMF authority against groups that didn't even exist in 9-11. It's the principles of co-belligerency drawn from the law of war. And so 
it's, it's not just a one-way street and sort of restricting government authority. There are principles drawn from that very relevant body of law that Congress could sensibly be thought to have legislated against the backdrop of that helps shore up the government's authority in certain areas to engage in detention of certain persons who are affiliated with groups that are not literally the groups responsible for 9-11, but ones now affiliated or associated with them. And so if Congress were to sort of confirm its view by statute um, that that's an appropriate way to think about that authority, I think that operationally actually could be very helpful to the government. Well, one, other, one other quick point on this. You know, if Congress and the administration were to follow what I take to be Trevor's implicit advice here, which is, you know, focus on codification of existing understandings and doctrine and administration litigating positions rather than creating new frameworks that are either more or less restrictive, which, is, by the way, I'm completely sympathetic to that as a, um, and so you think about legislation not as changing the landscape so much as, it, as putting a democratic stamp of legitimacy on the landscape um, that, that is emerging. Um, there is actually an, a significant overlap of the Venn diagrams between congressional um, interests and administration interests to make it possible to envision such a thing. So the McKeon legislation on the substantive scope of detention authority is verbatim the same as the administration's litigating position. And the administration issued an executive order um, on review which McKeon you know, has some differences with, but wants to codify a mechanism of review. And so you could really imagine taking those two things, marrying them together, thrashing out some agreement as to, you know, how you're going to do the review mechanism that's a little bit more McKeon-like than the executive order and a little bit more exec uh, executive order-like than the McKeon bill. And you could imagine a framework emerging from it that's very little different from, from existing practice. The, the, ha the hang-up areas that, that make this difficult actually you know, have to do with whether there will be continued congressional interference in the ability to transfer detainees whom you've decided you want to release. And secondly, um, what do you do with new detainees whom the administration would like to treat as criminal suspects and whom a lot of congressional Republicans and actually a lot of congressional Democrats too don't want anywhere near a federal court. Uh, on that note, let me ask a short targeted question for all of you. Would, does anyone think it's defensible or a good idea that Congress has used its power of the purse to restrain the ability first to transfer out of Guantanamo <coughs> to release or custody in third countries? Is this a defensible policy? No. <laughs> don't have to all answer. <laughs> we could just let Ben's ring in denunciation. Well, liter literally, uh, is it defensible? Sure. Everything's <laughs> defensible. <laughs> they are. Def it done. They are. They they are defending it, and they have defended it. Um, is it a good idea as a matter of policy? Uh, no, it's not. All right. So I just want to get that out on the table. But uh, but, but, but yeah. it, it bears it bears. Some, I mean, not the, the one word answer is, is powerful, I suppose, but, but it bears some explanation as to the reason. I mean, look, you know, these detention is a complex human system that will fail a certain percentage of the time, and you're going to end up detaining people who, whose detentions you really come to regret over time. Release. The ability to release people is essential to the ability to conduct detention in a responsible fashion. In addition, there are people who are very important to detain for certain periods of time, and then you can make responsible arrangements that allow you to not detain them. And not detaining people, for a lot of reasons, is generally preferable to detaining people. Um, not simply because of the human liberty costs involved, but because of a lot of other considerations, intergovernmental considerations, public image considerations, you know, all sorts of things. The burden on our forces to have to conduct these operations is non-trivial. Um, and so it, it really is a mindless and stupid thing to, to, to put um, 
to, to impair the function of deciding when you don't need to do this. Um, oh, and one, one, one other dimension of that, there are certain circumstances in which governments you know, that will not take responsibility for their own nationals come over time to be willing to take responsibility for their own nationals. And it is, a, a, again, a stupid and mindless thing on the part of the Congress of the United States that says when you have an opportunity to get a government to take responsibility for somebody, you, you, you can't take advantage of that. Well, let me just um, chime in. That last point's a, an important one. I wouldn't say it quite the same way, but. Um, <laughs> in case it's just out here. Oh, that was Ben Wittes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's interesting that in, in legislating this kind of restriction, Congress has actually um, treated detention uh, more like a criminal process, which is something that they, they often criticize. In other words, one of the really important aspects of administrative detention in the context of, of terrorism is that you have a threat that you're, you're trying to mitigate a threat that evolves and changes over time. And so if you're constructing a rational system to deal with that, part of the equation that the decision maker has to look at every time they look at the case is, is this, is this person uh, a threat, a continuing threat? And the, the detainee changes over time. They may change um, because of access to certain kinds of reintegration programs. They may change because while in custody they have learned to read, which allowed them to take a look at a Koran. It, it's funny, but you know, 90 plus percent of the detainees we had in Afghanistan were illiterate. So literacy was a, a huge, a hugely important program for us because if you can teach a, a detainee how to read the Koran during their time in the facility, they actually have the ability to question the things that they are being taught in the madrasa that led them to be a suicide bomber in the first place. So that as the as the detainee changes over time, which happens not just in the in the context of terrorism, it happens in our prisons in the United States and in state and federal. Uh, prisons where we have education programs and literacy programs as well, the threat changes. And so to restrict the ability uh, to release somebody ignores one of the really the critical components of an administrative detention scheme, which is that you're not just, the, the question that you're asking is not just what did the person do. Um, the question that you're asking is given what the person did and given the changes or, or lack of changes that the person has, the detainee has exhibited during their time in custody, does it make sense to us from a security standpoint to continue to spend money, time, energy detaining the person. And so it, it seems to me misguided um, to, to restrict the process of releasing someone when that's such a critical component of, of having a rational detention policy. Can yeah. I just, yeah. just add one thought on that, which, which seems right. I mean, I, it's my sense, I, I could be wrong, I could certainly be wrong about this, but it's my sense anyway that the, the sort of leading proponents in Congress of, of of imposing the restrictions on transfer and the restrictions on prosecution, which I think you've separated out, at least for now, yes. we just talk about yes. the transfer ones, um, transfer to third countries, might not themselves say that they think that in, you know, in an ideal world there ought to be those legislative restrictions. I think that they're there uh, because there's a kind of lack of trust between the legislative and executive branches over whether the kinds of factors that Mike's just talked about and the Ben talked about are going to be sort of taken into account in the appropriate <coughs> way. So if they had a, and, and you know, that kind of sort of trust deficit shows up all over the place in these, in these debates, right? It's very hard to read the Supreme Court's Boumediene uh, opinion and not think that a substantial part of what was driving a majority of the court there was that it had just concluded it couldn't trust the processes that the executive branch had put in place through the the combatant status review tribunals and the ARBs at Guantanamo. Um, and here, it seems to me like this is a kind of you know, symptom or, or evidence of lack of trust between the legislative and executive branches. And so it, it might be that the way to sort of deal with those legislative restrictions over time would be, and I don't mean to blame either the executive or the legislative branch for this lack of trust. When trust breaks down, it's sort of you know, got to be both parties' fault in some way. Um, it's sort of how to restore that, and at a point of restoration, you know, that might be when those kinds of legislative restrictions could get lifted. And you know, if I knew how to do that, um, <laughs> I, I'd be trying to do it. I, you know, but but it seems I, I think that might be the best way to think about it, as opposed to 
you know, does anyone really think these legislative restrictions in an ideal world are the best way to regulate this area of government action? I'm, I don't know if anyone does. Uh, it's sort of a, they think that it's less bad than the executive branch irresponsibly exercising its authority in this area. I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, I, both sides bear some responsibility for the, the breakdown of trust here. It was a, you know, it's a complicated thing. But I do think there's a mechanism by which the restoration of that trust is, is foreseeable. And it's the codification of some review mechanism um, that builds in the factors that Congress is not confident the administration is really adequately considering. And if you imagine creating the review process legislatively in a fashion that has congressional buy-in and that takes account of Congress's concerns, you could imagine the administration saying, we'll, we'll let you write that into the review process. But then when someone gets through that review process, you actually have to honor the outcome and let that person be transferred or in the case of bringing somebody to a criminal trial, you know, bring somebody to a criminal trial. So I think that point about trust is a really important and accurate one, and because certainly I don't think the administration actually is failing to take into account these very obviously right. important considerations, and so it does reflect lack of trust. It also reflects the, the, the bright political spotlight that shines on Guantanamo, and several of the comments earlier were highlighting how, uh, Mike, you were saying, you know, how fortunate it was that that same spotlight doesn't shine on the parallel identical issues that your task force had to grapple with, that you were having to grapple with, uh, I wonder if you could talk about how things went in terms of the, the detainee review board process in Afghanistan, which is the, the in-theater detention system equivalent to the screening dis decision-making process that decides are we going to keep or not keep particular persons. Um, without this, the partisan and political spotlight shining on it, how does the system in-theater work and, and what sort of results did you see? Yeah, and, and just to give you a sense of why that's fortunate, um, in 2010, uh, we, being the U.S. government, 435, uh, took in about 1,300 detainees, released about 600. Um, if, if there were restrictions of the type um, that apply, that wouldn't have been possible, and the cost, the counterinsurgency cost of that, the diplomatic cost of that would have been immense. Um, because in theater detention operations, the cost of holding someone is much greater. Um, than, than out of theater because you have a host government, you have a population uh, that notices it's covered in the media every day and it directly affects uh, our ability to win the hearts and mind of, of the population. Um, the, the substantive standard that the detainee review boards uh, in Afghanistan have used for some time plays off of that March 13th definition. It asks uh, a question of detainability and then it asks a question of ongoing threat. And the question of detainability is, uh, roughly was someone part of or substantially supporting forces associated with 9-11. It does, I think, rely on that uh, principles that Trevor was talking about before. And then the ongoing threat question asks, is continued internment necessary to mitigate an ongoing threat, or is there some other disposition option that we can rely on? So could we transfer the person to the government of Afghanistan for prosecution? Could we transfer them into a reintegration or reconciliation program? Um, or do we just feel like even though he was legally detainable, we don't need to hold the guy anymore because he's just not dangerous anymore. Um, so that's the, the legal standard that the detainee review boards were operating under. Um, we're coming to a point of having about 3,000 per year uh, detainee review boards. So uh, during, during my year that I have watched hundreds of them. Trevor has watched some of them when he came over, spent some time with us in Afghanistan. The, the major ways I think that the process changed over time and the major ways they're different from uh, the Guantanamo review process is that um, when you're doing detention operations in theater, you actually have access to evidence that is, is simply not available when you're separated uh, both by distance and time in the way that most of the Guantanamo detainees are. So we were able to bring in, uh, I think, 3,000 uh, Afghan witnesses either in person um, through telephonic testimony, by video teleconference, or through letters. Um, and that's really important because uh, it, when you're dealing with the kinds of um, intelligence-based captures that you deal with in a, in a theater of combat, um, it's really important to have uh, a, a sort of perspective that may be a little bit different from the intelligence sources that lead to the capture. And the people who are from the villages, 
family members, elders, tribal leaders, um, can provide uh, a, a much better picture um, than sometimes uh, than, than some of your intelligence sources may be able to provide. Sometimes you have guys who will come in, on the other hand, and uh, you'll get you know four elders from the detainee's village who come and testify, and they say, "I've known this guy for 20 years. He would never do anything wrong. Uh, he's uh, you know a great model citizen." And then when the recorder starts to ask questions of the elder, they say, "How do you know him?" Well, I've never actually met him before, but um, you know his family tells me that he's. Well, how do you know the family? Well, I haven't really met the family, but um, you know I know the name. So. There, there are varying degrees of reliability in this process as there are in a, in a criminal trial, uh, in, in criminal testimony that you'd see in the United States. But the witnesses were very important um, in the sense of, of having a more robust process, but also in terms of engagement um, with the Afghans who, before we allowed Afghan witnesses into the process, had absolutely no understanding of what happened to detainees when they would come into uh, United States detention. Uh, it was largely a process shrouded in secrecy. There were, uh, media was not allowed in, journalists were not allowed in. Um, all those things changed over the course of the year though. So we have uh, the press that regularly comes and watches the detainee review boards there. We have the ICRC that can monitor anytime they want. The Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission was allowed in to see any process they want. And I think that transparency helped make the process uh, more substantial. I think it allowed us to um, take good lessons learned uh, from people who came in, uh, people like Trevor who came in and watched and made suggestions on how to uh, reform the process. And um, little things, even, you know, little suggestions that, that cause us to change over time just include, uh, to include something as small as the script that a, uh, that a recorder, uh, who is the, the functional equivalent of a prosecutor, the recorder plays sort of a neutral fact presenting role in front of the boards. The script that they were using um, created some sort of abnormalities in the process whereby a lot of information that's unclassified was finding its way into the closed session or the classified session. Just by changing sort of, you know, two lines in a script, we were able to make sure that more of the, or almost all, of the unclassified evidence would be presented in a setting where the detainee could hear it and contest it. So uh, little things like that that we were able to tweak over the course of the year, I think, uh, made it uh, a far more robust process and, and one that looks nothing like um, the CSRTs or the CSERTs looked uh, if you just read the transcript or if you saw them. Let me ask you two pointed follow-up questions so that we learn more because it's, it's a new chance to get some insight into the in-theater detention realm. You mentioned third country nationals earlier and uh, is there, I'm not sure how much you're able or free to say about that, but I'd love to know um, in what way does that present problems for, for our detention process and in what way does it present problems for the ongoing effort to shift detention or prosecution responsibility into the Afghan system? And, and related to that, do the Afghans have a non-criminal detention framework? Are they going to have it? Um, okay. Hard questions. And yeah, sorry. I kind of threw um, some grenades in your direction there. So. Talking about third country nationals is, is a, little, a little challenging for me, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, the first thing to understand is that the number is very small. So 1,600 approximately detainees held by the United States in Afghanistan, number of third country nationals is less than 50. Um, roughly two-thirds of that number are Pakistani. Um, so the, the number of uh, folks who are truly from out of theater is very small. Um, it does present a challenge for transition because you have uh, a number of third country nationals who are present. Um, many of them are from countries that uh, you would predict and you'd be correct are very difficult for us to return uh, detainees to for a variety of reasons. Um, so there are, are difficulties in transferring them to their, host, uh, to their home country. Um, there are difficulties in continuing to hold them and there are limited disposition options outside of that because, as you may guess, the government of Afghanistan is not particularly interested in prosecuting uh, third country nationals who we've held for a, a long period of time uh, at Bagram. Um, so it does present a problem for us uh, in the same way that folks have been uh, working in D.C. for uh, several years now uh, to find disposition options for <coughs> folks in Guantanamo. That same process exists for the third country nationals uh, at, at PAR-1. Um, and 
I think that's I think that's about the limit yeah, of what I can say. Um, it, it creates problems for the Afghans in the sense that they are not particularly interested in in prosecuting third country nationals, unless of course they're Pakistani. Um, in which case, <laughs> in which case they're very interested in prosecuting. Um, does Afghanistan have non uh, criminal detention options? No. Um, the only authority under which the government of Afghanistan can detain is under its uh, criminal law and criminal procedure and its constitution. The United States for many years has been uh, engaged in a dialogue with uh, the Karzai administration about recognizing some form of uh, detention other than its ordinary criminal process. Why is that? Um, the <coughs> Afghan criminal procedure code requires uh, any person who is detained, and, and detention is really only recognized by the Afghan police uh, or its uh, security forces, its national director of security. Those people have to be turned over to a prosecutor in 72 hours, and they have to be brought to trial in 15 days. There is a one-time 15-day extension um, that's allowed. The reality on the ground is that those, restri those restrictions, those rules, are never, ever followed. Uh, you would be hard-pressed to find a, uh, any one of the 18,000 individuals held in the Afghan prison system who was brought to trial within 15 days. Um, and you know, there may be some who were brought to trial within 30 days, but it's a very, it's a, it's a small number. Um, and even if fully resourced, um, in, in other words, even if, even if they had the kind of money that they, that they don't have now, there's 100 districts of the 300 plus in Afghanistan that have no judge. Um, and around that many that have no prosecutor. So if you're imagining uh, a, a how this system could function, especially as Afghanistan begins to take more responsibility for security operations, they simply just don't have the capability to bring people to criminal trial in the time frames that are set up by their law. Not to mention um, that their law does not recognize uh, an affirmative detention authority for the army, which is doing most of the clearing operations and therefore will do most of the apprehending of individuals out in the field. There's no uh, provisions for the use of intelligence in criminal trials. In fact, uh, something most people uh, don't know and those who do know don't talk about, there are no rules of evidence in Afghanistan. So it stands to reason that there would be no provisions for the use of classified information. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the challenge um, that you're facing, if you're thinking about how do I take uh, a population of roughly 1,500 detainees and put them into the Afghan criminal justice system so that they can bring all of these people under their law, is an immense one. Um, because they don't have the legal structure for it, because they don't have the personnel for it, um, and, uh, and because it's difficult to uh, imagine, given the limited resources uh, that their government has to deal with a time when they will have those assets. Um, so there has been this ongoing discussion between the U.S. government and the Afghan government about the need to recognize some other type of detention authority, even if only limited, because otherwise the detentions that will take place will take place in an extrajudicial fashion, and you may wind up with some of the problems that Pakistan and its military has faced in, in prosecuting its counterinsurgency, uh, which is something that no responsible government would want. Um, so there is that ongoing discussion. It, it remains to be seen whether Afghanistan will uh, adopt any of those measures. Uh, if I had to guess, uh, I would say that they probably won't. Uh, and there are reasons for that um, that are tied to uh, the, the, the way that President Karzai views um, the conflict uh, and the political pressures that he faces in his parliament. That's a lot to absorb. Um, but lest we leave the impression that things are only difficult in Afghanistan, let's swing the spotlight back to Guantanamo and habeas. So uh, a week or so ago in the, in the Esmail decision, Judge Silberman uh, from the DC Circuit had a really remarkable concurring opinion in which he, well, he laid into everybody, and especially the Supreme Court, really denouncing the Supreme Court uh, for, as Trevor described it earlier in Boumedien, leaving it to the lower courts to flesh out the details of how habeas would work. Um, and, and that's not a new discovery. You, we've seen similar arguments from elsewhere. Um, what was really interesting was where he went on to say, uh, and it's not really been worth it, Supreme Court, because uh, 
the whole habeas process doesn't really have any teeth to it. And this strangely echoed the view, unexpectedly echoed the view advanced by the, uh, the Guantanamo habeas bar, which has been arguing in connection with the Uyghur cases, that uh, in fact uh, habeas has no teeth, that the, the unwillingness, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs, to, uh, to compel some release out of limbo when there's trouble transferring a non-detainable person to some appropriate third country makes the whole thing turn out to be just smoke and mirrors. Um, so <coughs> any comments on in response to Silverman? Well, I, I wrote a lengthy comment in response to Silverman, so I guess I'll address that. I, I, I have very high regard for uh, Judge Silverman, but he's completely wrong on this latter point. And, and I, I mean, uh, he's empirically wrong. Um, so, th but it, it's an important point because it has become a kind of, um, it, it gets repeated now on the right as well as on the left. But for example, a Washington Post story the other day mentioned as a matter of fact that no detainee had been released pursuant to a habeas order. Um, you know, this is, a, this is the central issue in the Uyghur litigation, which is now on cert petition. And now Judge Silberman has sort of talked about in, in this concurring opinion about how the habeas process is basically just a mechanism for issuing advisory opinions because the courts have no ability to compel the release of the people they ordered release. So that's the meme. It's really out there. It's really pervasive. And it's false. Um, here are the actual numbers. Um, the um, courts have ordered um, the release of, of 17 Uyghurs of whom uh, 12 have been released pursuant to those, that order. Um, the additional five who remain are at Guantanamo because they turned down the resettlement options that the government in fact found for them. The government acknowledges itself to be bound by, to release them by the terms of the, the, the order in question in, in Kiemba. Uh, there are 14 additional cases where either the government did not appeal a um, adverse habeas judgment or appealed and then later dropped the appeal. All of those people have been released pursuant to those orders. So in other words, there are 26 cases, not zero, in which the government has received an adverse habeas judgment and has complied with it. And I, I don't know of any statement by anybody in the government, public or not, in which they have suggested that they are doing these things as a discretionary matter as opposed to doing these things because they lost a habeas litigation and they were ordered to do so by a court. And so, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a troubling development that I, I share a lot of Judge Silberman's frustration, and some of the other judges have articulated it too, so the sort of frustrations with um, the way the Supreme Court dumped all this on the district court's lap and refused to provide any guidance. Um, but I, I do think this idea that's developed that the process is entirely empty is just kind of nonsense. And um, I, I, I don't think it's a healthy thing to be debating the merits of the habeas process on the basis of a factual, um, sort of on the basis of a, of a significant piece of factual misinformation. So I completely agree with that. Uh, I, if you haven't, uh, I don't know if this is on anymore. Well, maybe it's it on. Uh, uh, if, uh, if you haven't uh, looked at Ben's post on the, on the blog that he and Bobby and Jack Goldsmith run on res responding to Judge Silverman's opinion, I really commend it to you. Uh, I think he's right on all points. And in many ways, there, there are a number of points that he makes in response to Judge Silverman. But I think the most significant one is this one, the, the, the pure factual error uh, that nevertheless gets repeated um, and gets a kind of presumption of correctness by repetition uh, that uh, the the, the decisions of the courts in these habeas cases are being flouted. Uh, it's, it's just false. Uh, the operative number is, is 26, as, as Ben points out. And to me, the other operative number is a zero. That is, if you take out the very difficult case of the Uyghurs, uh, it's my understanding that, there, that the number of final orders of release from a habeas court that have been flouted by the government is zero. Uh, 
Um, so there, there isn't anyone with a final order of release outside the Uyghurs that the government is refusing to release. And it's, it's my understanding too, although Ben knows the, the, pen, the pending legislation better than I do, I think the bills that you know, would, would continue the restrictions on transfer make an exception for someone with a final release order from a habeas court. That's correct. So Congress is not contemplating shutting down that uh, legal <laughs> obligation that the executive branch would have to honor a judgment of a habeas court. That there are cases where the government has resisted a decision of a district court, appealed and won. Uh, the notion that that would entail lawlessness is unrecognizable to me because you know, the government is allowed to appeal in a system that provides for appeals. Um, and the, Uyg you know, the Uyghurs are a very hard case. Um, one thing that needs stressing there, of course, is that uh, what one, the, the Uyghurs are not asking to be returned to China. <laughs> and there are good reasons for that. And the, and the government is not doing that. Um, in part because I, I'm insufficiently expert in this area of international law, I don't know that it's entirely settled how the, the Convention Against Torture applies to people being interned by the United States outside the United States. But they're taking very seriously the threat of torture as a matter of legal policy, whether or not formal um, legal command, and have spent enormous resources in the last administration and this one, therefore trying to find third country resettlement options, and ha have indeed found options for all remaining detainees there. And that's why the Supreme Court uh, uh, dismissed the writ. Uh, in Kiemba the first time it was up in response to that important factual development. So there's no getting around, though, that the continued unlawful detention of those people at Guantanamo is deeply problematic. Uh, but it's a special case. And the number beyond them at Guantanamo who have final release orders that are being flouted by the executive branch is, and in my view, will remain bubkis. And, 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 and two additional points on that. I mean, the Uyghurs are a special case for all the reasons that Trevor just said, and there's this additional one, which is that they had a release option and mm. they turned it down. Absolutely. And in fact, yeah. depending on whether you believe their briefs or the Supreme Court per curiam in the, in the cert dismissal, they had either one or two release options. Right. And you know, so this is, even the Uyghurs are not a case of the, of the point that is, that is being made. Um, and then the, 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 the only other point I would make is that there is a theoretical issue underlying this that is non-trivial, um, which is that you can imagine the situation in which you had a release order from a, from, of a detainee from a country that it was unthinkable that you would return that person to, um, and um, no country would step up and take, not one that they didn't want to go to, but no country, right? And then you would really have the issue that um, the Uyghur lawyers are trying to ma make their case seem to be, and that Judge Silberman is saying exists in general. I, I, this is a real possibility that this could someday arise. It has not yet arisen. And I, I don't think it's worth debating the terms of the merits of the habeas process on the basis of that hypothetical. I have a million more questions, but I'd really like to get you involved now. So uh, are there going to be mics circulating? OK, great. So Joy and, and Bev have the mics. Um, please just raise your hand and draw the attention. Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, why don't we go to the gentleman in the, in the uh, orange uh, shirt or sweater in the back? That's what happens when a UT person is uh, moderating. <laughs> That's right. Go to the burn orange. I saw some burn orange in the back, and I went to it. wrong with that. <laughs> Um, this question is probably uh, from Michael, but maybe since Trevor's been in Afghanistan, he can come on, comment on it. <coughs> Let's say you touched on that the Taney Review Board, but broadening that out a little bit. Let's say I'm a terrorist over there, an Afghani terrorist. You catch me. When does my legal process begin? How are you going to treat me? How long is that hearing going to last uh, besides uh, teaching me how to read, what are you going to do for me? And then in the end, if I'm a hardcore terrorist, where's, where am I going? Or if I'm a good guy, so to speak, how do you release me then? Sure. Um, so any individual apprehended, there, there's, there's two tracks. There's people who are apprehended by uh, US forces, and people who are apprehended by I, NATO ISAF coalition forces. And, and there's two separate systems that are used. And I'll, I'll focus on the US system.
Um, the U.S. system is if you're captured within 14 days, uh, you've either got to be released or transferred to our theater internment facility. And there are some, there are limited exceptions to that, but they're, they're very narrow. Um, you receive your first detainee review board within 60 days. So with, within 60 days, you have a personal representative, not a lawyer, but a personal representative, helps you prepare your case and you, are, you have your hearing before a administrative review panel made up of three field grade officers and they decide those two questions I talked about before, the question of attainability and the question of ongoing threat. Uh, if the board decides that uh, internment is the appropriate option, which happens about 60% of the time, or at least from the past year, uh, you'll receive another board every six months until such time that you're released. And the, each new board takes up the question as a new question. In other words, they don't give deference to the previous board decision. They're asking the, the question again, is this person legally detainable? And is there a continuing security need uh, to detain the person? While they're in the facility, they have access to not just literacy programs, but it's uh, it, whenever I tell people the list of programs that they ha have access to, it, it always elicits some laughter, so I'm preparing myself here. Um, they, there are literacy programs. There are uh, tailoring programs where they learn how to uh, be tailors with sewing machines that are being provided for them. There are math programs. There are um, an agricultural program where they learn uh, drip irrigation techniques and how to do better farming. And there is even, believe it or not, a beekeeping program uh, that's being uh, put into place by a U.S. Department of Agriculture representative who works up at the facility. Uh, all of these programs are linked to the kind of U.S. government development strategy that exists for Afghanistan to try to focus on the types of trades and vocational needs that exist. And then we're actually in partnership now with uh, British who funded a, voc a vocational technical training facility that's teaching carpentry and masonry skills, um, auto repair, things like that, so that when detainees leave, they'll have some kind of a skill. The idea being, if the majority of the people that you have in the facility are accidental guerrillas or people who are fighting because they didn't have another job, you provided them with something that's an alternative to rejoining the fight uh, at such time that they're released. The average stay in the facility is around 1.2 years. Um, so the, the average detainee is not staying there for, for long periods of time. And the number of detainees who have been held uh, for more than three years is, is very small. It's, uh, it's, it's in, the, I think, uh, is less than 8% of the population has been held for more than three years. I, having uh, spent just a few days uh, watching the process, I'll just say, you know, <laughs> to the extent it's, it, it's helpful, it's sort of, you know, vouching for what, for what Mike says. The DRV process itself, I think, is really quite a robust process, the, uh, uh, especially good when the, uh, when the officers who compose the board itself are, you know, doing their jobs very diligently. Um, the, it's, it's set up in such a way that enables them to drill down and ask the detainee, not just about some generalized allegation, but, you know, were you in this place at this time? Um, you know, the following things were recovered, are, are these things yours or not? I mean, very uh, sort of specific evidence is being drilled down on. Um, and the other thing I, I sort of found out about while I was out there that, that is just not part of the story here that Mike's already been alluding to is uh, how much effort is being put into trying to help the Afghans increase their prosecution capacity so that that can be a way to hand off some of these detainees even people who were found to meet the legal criteria for continued detention, um, the board will frequently now make a determination that the best way that that th for that threat to be dealt with is for the person to continue to be held, but pursuant to a uh, criminal conviction and sentence in the Afghan system. And there's a national security court, you know, presided over by Afghan judges on the base at Bagram. Um, and there's a whole lot of lawyer work and investigative work being done to try and, uh, you know, fit the round peg of an intelligence-based capture into the square hole of an evidence-based prosecution. Um, and the debate here in the United States about detention versus prosecution proceeds, uh, I often find, a, sort of based on an assumption that these things just are totally irreconcilable. Um, and I think the evidence on the ground in Afghanistan is that that's false. They're very difficult to reconcile, and it doesn't always work. Um, and one shouldn't assume a sort of neat transferability from one domain to the next. But a big uh, chunk of effort is being put into finding a way to move people out of U.S. detention operations when appropriate, uh, 
um, and to subject them to uh, to criminal charges in the Afghan system. And you know, there are, there are evidence labs at Bagram, um, and <coughs> there are, I understand they're sort of teaching Afghan prosecutors and judges how to think about things like fingerprint evidence, DNA evidence, you know, ballistics testing, et cetera. There's a whole lot of resources being poured into this, and it strikes me as a very substantial success story at this point. How quickly the capacity can be built up to deal with how many cases is the question, but, it, but it's happening to some degree. Let, let me just amplify that last point. When, when w our task force stood up, I got, I got there in January of 2010, there was no court. Um, there was no specialized court to try insurgents in Afghanistan. Um, that was built uh, in the first half of 2010. The first trial took place in June, the first ever uh, sort of trial at this specialized national security court that exists alongside the detention facility in Parwan. When I left, they had done 80 trials. Um, and for the, as, as we understand it, for the first time in Afghan history, there were, there were trials with an Afghan expert to test, an Afghan fingerprint expert to testify about not, not only the science uh, of matching a fingerprint, but also its, its basis uh, in the Quran. Um, which was interesting to watch. Um, <laughs> Fingerprints? What is that? Yeah. What is that? I, I am not competent <laughs> to describe <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the It's come so far, it's probably the thing I'm, I'm most proud of being associated with there because I think it really has come quite a long way um, to the point where the judges uh, began to ask more and more um, Difficult questions about you know how do how do IED how do IEDs work how powerful are they um, how does DNA evidence work they wanted experts to come in and teach them about the science of DNA testing and the as I was leaving the prosecutors were readying a uh, a trial to to try ten detainees in one in one trial all being held in the facility all of whom had been biometrically matched to a IED cache in Paktia province where they found something like three hundred unexploded. IEDs, they ran all the prints on them, they compared the prints um, to the population that were being held, that's being held uh, in Parwan and they matched it to 10 defendants. And the prosecutors who uh, had never done a insurgent case prior to June uh, were getting ready to try 10 defendants in what is a pretty complex uh, case right as I was re at leaving. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of progress. Huge challenges remain. Some of our investigators are illiterate. Um, some of the, you know, the, the, the challenges are immense, so I don't want to overstate it, but I think really significant progress has been made. Are you getting a lot of lessons, or are they getting a lot of lessons learned from Iraq? Because, of course, this whole process we went through in Iraq, and, and the exact same learning and handover and, and interagency teaching process was there. On the U.S. side, yes, absolutely. The, the former detention command and the current sort of the lingering elements of the detention command, there's this constant... Um, interchange between that and 435. Um, honestly, the Afghans aren't particularly interested in what happened in Iraq. So, um, and and the, the, the quickest way to lose an audience in Afghanistan is to say Iraq. Or the way we did things in Iraq was. Um, that, that's not a winning strategy for persuasion with the Afghans. So, uh, we, we, instead of that, we tried to use, uh, at least on the criminal side, lessons learned from our federal courts. We tried to internationalize the process to bring the British in, bring the Australians in to talk about how um, they do things in their court system, and we found that to be far more effective. Interesting. In the back. It would be very helpful to me uh, if each of you would describe exactly what the United States says its authority is for indefinite uh, detention understanding what you all have said already, that the government, all three uh, areas of the government are in agreement that we can do that. I would like very much to be able to take back to some of my friends why the government says they can do that. Uh, and I would like each of you, if you will, to give us your opinion on the government's position. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, <laughs> There are different theories that one could rely on for this detention authority, and in the first years after 9-11, uh, the government frequently in, in, in the cases, the habeas cases that were brought, early ones challenging detentions at Guantanamo and some 
the very, very small number of detentions of U.S. citizens under this authority in the United States, thinking of Yasser Hamdi and Jose Padilla, um, the government's briefs would sometimes run multiple theories. One of them was a theory that the president, as commander in chief, has a kind of inherent authority to order this sort of detention, an authority that he has uh, as a matter of the authority given to him by Article II of the Constitution. The other theory um, was then and remains now one that Congress has conferred this authority in the AUMF by um, authorizing the use of uh, necessary and appropriate military force um, that, although it doesn't say the word detention, what, the, what Justice O'Connor said in the Hamdi case in 2004 was that that's appropriately understood against the backdrop of the kind of force that is typically used in an armed conflict, um, and that includes detention of the enemy. The Hamdi court confirmed the existence of that detention authority then as a matter of domestic law as based in what Congress had conferred in the AUMF. You can ask your question as a matter of international law too, and it's a different conversation, but as a matter of the domestic law enforceable by the US courts in, in the cases where they have jurisdiction, or just applicable even in circumstances where there isn't judicial review, like the detentions at Bagram, but where US law is you know, part of the conversation, I think the uh, now very widely accepted answer among lawyers who are working on this at least is that Congress conferred this authority in the AUMF. Um, it remains difficult to know the precise boundaries of that authority, uh, but the government's so-called March 13th definition, which is in reference to briefs that it filed on March 13th of 2009, shortly after the, Obama, the beginning of the Obama administration, it filed briefs sort of letting the district courts in DC know what the administration's new theory of detainability would be, and it's drawn entirely, or it's based entirely on the AUMF as read against the backdrop of uh, what, what the definition calls for traditional principles drawn from the law of war. Um, so descriptively, I think that's the source of the authority as a domestic law matter, mm -hmm. and where I am is I think that's an entirely defensible and indeed correct understanding. I think it would be quite odd to think that Congress had conferred no detention authority in the AUMF. Um, among other things, it would set up some pretty perverse incentives when we confront the enemy on the battlefield. The scope of that detention is really hard to figure out, and that's where the hard cases are. Um, but the idea that the AUMF entails some detention authority, I think, is uh, the dominant view now, and, and, and for me, the correct one. I, I agree with all of that. Um, I just a couple of uh, a couple of points of amplification and emphasis. Um, the scope of the authority and what it means in practice and the outer boundaries of it are the subject of very feverish um, litigation um, and judicial attention in the district court in Washington and in the DC circuit. Um, and there is a ongoing and particularly fascinating dialogue between the district judges and the appellate judges on this subject about which the press is dramatically uninterested. <laughs> and and I, I mean, it's, it's a very striking. Except uh, just to call it lawless detention occasionally. Well, right, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist by background, and so the, 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 it's a subject of sort of ongoing bewilderment to me. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is, th there is a huge policy making exercise going on. I don't mean that in a disparaging way, just in a descriptive way in this litigation between the district courts and the appellate court. And um, it is a policy making exercise that the Supreme Court assigned when it said, you know, there's habeas jurisdiction, we leave the details to the district court in the first instance. Um, and it is a policy making exercise that the Congress agreed to, sort of acceded to, to, to that, um, assignment by not then getting involved in setting some of the parameters. And the result is that you have this string of cases in which the question of the, the parameters that Trevor refers to and sort of the outer boundaries are being discussed. And it is really, it's quite a remarkable thing how little attention it gets and how uninterested, I mean, I go to all of these oral arguments and I am the only person who goes to them to write about them. Um, on, a, on a regular week in, week out basis. Occasionally there will be somebody else there to write about them. It is basically going unremarked upon 
by the press, and and it's a, and the result of it is that, as Trevor says, the public debate lags dramatically behind the actual state of play, and we're still debating the sort of lawless detention thing, and that's not where the debate is anymore. Let me chime in too with a, a little bit of further clarification about sort of why there's so much uncertainty, even. In, you know, Trevor bracketed the international law issues, and I'll, I'll do the same. Just talking about, if, even if you construe the authorization for use of military force to confer some detention authority, and, and further, you, you flesh the AUMF out by saying, and this refers at least to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, huge questions remain. For, for example, with, when you say Al-Qaeda, what exactly does one mean? Right. Does that include, for example, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the, the Yemeni uh, branch? Does it include Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb? There's all these uh, co-branded and in various degrees affiliated uh, entities where reasonable people can disagree about whether they come within the scope of the reference to Al-Qaeda in the AUMF. Even within Al-Qaeda, then there's questions about, well, which particular persons are part of Al-Qaeda? And what the courts have boiled it down to at this point is a consensus, but not a terribly helpful consensus. The consensus is, being part of Al-Qaeda is a functional inquiry. That sounds reasonable to me, but a functional inquiry into what exactly remains very, very loose and, and, and slippery. Does it, you know, these aren't card-carrying membership organizations where someone has in their back pocket member since 1998. Um, do you have to have, you know, what exactly must your role be in the context of a clandestine affiliation network in which relationships are fluid? and people might themselves not be sure wh how they would categorize themselves. You throw on top of that what Mike mentioned earlier about the co-belligerence. So the AUMF refers to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban very plausibly. It doesn't directly refer to the Haqqani network or various other organizations with which we are actually fighting. And you have to import into it, by analogy to the laws of war, I think, the co-belligerency concept. And once you are fighting against somebody, whatever else is true, it's not a dispute that the laws of war are going to give you authorities there, but you, you get a feel for the complexity, and that's what the courts have been grappling with as, as Ben describes it. And, and, and just to, you know, you know w when you, th there are, be because of the lack of the sort of membership card, you know, indicia of membership, which if you think about it in the context of US forces, this is uniforms, right? And you, you take away all of those things that, that allow you to identify the enemy when captured, and you end up with, with, with these very, very hard kind of granular fact patterns that you then have to decide whether they amount to probability of being part of for purposes of the definition of detainability. The DC Circuit, in addition, so, so you get fact patterns like, for example, one of the cases that they, dis they decided the other day involves a guy who there's no direct evidence of anything. But he travels to Afghanistan. He has his travel paid for from Yemen. He had attended a sort of radical school. And he's, go, uh, he, he's caught with a bunch of guys sort of near Tora Bora. Some of the guys he's caught with turn out to be uh, bin Laden bodyguards. And the, the court is asked, well, is this, does this establish membership? Um, and you know, I, I bet you know, it's actually a little interesting exercise. You know, this is like a Rorschach test, <laughs> you know? So how many people sort of think that establishes membership versus not? You bring that up in a cocktail party conversation <laughs> and, and you, you, you'll, you'll get a sense of how contentious these questions are. Um, you know, the other thing that they're still struggling with to give you an idea of how, how much we're still sort of building the pieces of this, they're still arguing about who has the burden of proof and what it is. Um, and so the government says that, acknowledges that it has the burden of proof and that it should be preponderance of the evidence. And at least four judges on the DC circuit think the government is being overly conservative and that it should not have to establish preponderance of the evidence in order to prevail in these cases. And so, you know, think about it as, as a, you know, a, a house structure that's being built in which every brick of the foundation is in play. There are many more bricks than there were a year ago. Um, there are still, um, it is still entirely in flux, and a cert grant could happen any time and could tear the whole house down. And as, as if that weren't complicated enough, 
uh, my colleagues here, um, perhaps, uh, perhaps deliberately, perhaps not, danced around what, what may be the hardest question, which is not membership or part of, but what do you do with the people who aren't part of but are providing support yeah, to right. uh, these yes. organizations? And, um, and, and that question is a very, very difficult and very contentious one. And it's incredibly important in theater operations because you have, uh, for example, large numbers of individuals in Afghanistan who are not part of the Taliban and are not part of the Haqqani network and not part of the HIG. Um, but because of a lack of security, because of night letters, because of intimidation, end up providing significant support um, to insurgent activities that directly result in the death of Afghan civilians and coalition forces. And so the legal theory on which you say we can hold um, this, this farmer, who we all agree is not part of the Taliban and not part of the Haqqani, Haqqani network, but for the last two to three years has provided significant and demonstrable support um, to those organizations for whatever reasons, um, that debate is a, a very important one, uh, an unresolved one, and, um, and one that I think we could spend you know, oh, two yeah, hours talking absolutely. about. And, and if that were not enough, <laughs> you, well, also, more. you also have this overlay of the entire Guantanamo habeas um, discussion as to whether it is in fact limited to Guantanamo, you know, and this is a, this, is, this litigation takes on, an it, if there is a Las Vegas principle that applies to Guantanamo, you know, what happens there stays there, then, 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 then the Guantanamo cases are a very interesting quirk and oddity um, that kind of inform our larger understanding of the law of detention, but are basically about a legacy problem of an earlier phase of, of American counterterrorism operations. But you know, there were about 10 ways to write Boumedien that made it clear that it was limited to Guantanamo, and the Supreme Court didn't do any of them. It adopted a, a test that is so complicated that between Judge Bates and the District Court and the DC Circuit, they can't even decide how many parts it has, whether it's a three-part test or a six-part test. And the question of whether that three-part functional test or six-part functional test will eventually be found to be, to be that Guantanamo is the only facility in the world that meets it, or whether some of the detentions that you've been, that, that Mike has been talking about, ha, you know, will come to be incorporated into this body of law is a very open one and probably will be decided by factors like um, how sympathetic a given case is when it presents to the Supreme Court for extension of habeas review and how good a job the DRB will have done and whether that DRB will have looked nothing like the CSRTs in which the Supreme Court had no trust to go back to Trevor's earlier point or whether they will look like a or whether they will look a little bit too much like that for the Supreme Court's comfort and, and so I think overlying the whole thing is an anxiety and a question about whether this is a discrete body of 150 or so cases that will do and then they'll be done, or whether this is you know, the thin edge of a much larger web of global judicialization of detention operations. So we have time for just uh, one short final question. I believe someone's got the microphone in the back, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that this is short, so it may not be able to, uh, to be dealt with in the time that we have left. But, but turning to the question that's been bracketed, which is sort of the international law piece of this, which uh, I'd be interested in the thoughts of the panelists on, on, on this issue. Um, when you s talk about law of war principles governing detention, when we talk about law of war principles governing detention, uh, and I'm thinking not just limited to Guantanamo, but you know, other non-international armed conflicts, Iraq, Afghanistan, are you speaking of, or are we speaking of use at bellum principles? Are we talking about use in bello principles? Are we talking about both? Uh, and then when we talk about you know, the law of wars that applies to you know, international armed conflict or non-international armed conflict, do you think that the law of war affirmatively authorizes detention uh, of this type, or that it simply acknowledges uh, the fact that states do such things in armed conflicts and then you know, sets forth to regulate the circumstances of those detentions. And, and I, we probably can't answer that in the time we've got left, but uh, I would be interested in the, in the thoughts of the panelists on this composition. 
I'll take a yeah, quick right. initial track, uh, yeah. shot at that. So those are exactly the right questions to ask from an international law perspective. And in a brief time, let me try to sketch the, the lay of the land on this. If we were talking of international armed conflict, these wouldn't be very difficult questions. We're not talking about international armed conflict. There was a brief window of that in fall 2001. That's not our current situation. If it were, we would simply be able to point to either protected person status and security internment, or we could point to POW status, or we could, we could have these debates and we could point to affirmative treaty authority that would seem to authorize these detentions. In the non-international armed conflict context, famously, you don't have parallel affirmative recognition in treaty law that says you can detain for the duration of hostilities, uh, there's a POW, or you can have periodic security internment of uh, protected persons. What happened in Iraq over the years was, despite it being in, in a NIAC context, we analogized, in effect, to the security internment regime of the Fourth Geneva Convention and did it to the tune of tens of thousands of detainees for years and years. And it all seemed to go without much controversy. That's not our explicit model in Afghanistan, I believe, and it's certainly not the explicit model in Guantanamo. Could be, but it's not. Instead, it's, in, it's the uh, enemy combatant or now enemy belligerent uh, model or at least I think that's fair to describe. And you get into these questions of, well, since Common Article 3, or if you will, uh, Additional Protocol 2, if you prefer, since they don't confer uh, affirmative authority to detain for the duration of hostilities, can you really say you're pointing to international law to find your authority in, in domestic law? And one way to respond to that is, no, you can't. So Human Rights First and Gabor Rona has said, you, know, you, can't, you can't point to it. It's not provided in, in IHL. Others say IHL is a body of restraint. So Ryan Goodman says it's a body of restraint, and if it fails to forbid it, then that means you can, you can certainly do at least as much in an IAC as you could do in an IAC, and you should be able to do by analogy what you could do in an international armed conflict. Any, any further thoughts? I, I, I mean, I agree with that, and the, just the shape of the reasoning in a domestic law, in the domestic law setting, I think isn't, I don't think the theory of the March 13th definition, for example, is that the authority itself actually is drawn from international law, but that there's a set of principles relevant by analogy um, that in a domestic law setting we would say the so-called charming Betsy canon would kind of apply here, that Congress is deemed to have legislated in a manner consistent with those <coughs> principles. Those principles, I think, are use in bello, not use at bellum. Um, uh, but the theory is not one of direct applicability, at least as, 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 we're, as we're kind of importing those principles into the domestic law context. But that by itself doesn't answer the question of if you just had an international law conversation. If you just had an international conversation, I think that the position of the government, well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain, but I think it's probably more like the, the position that Bobby's just attributed to Ryan Goodman. That's and right. That is the absence of a prohibition. You get a glimmer of this too yeah. in the al Awlaki briefing That's on, right. on targeted killing. Yeah. And now that was about not detention but targeted killing in, in Yemen. Um, in the government's brief, it was mainly about fighting off jurisdictionally the, the, the idea that they should even litigate the case. But there's, there's some discussion about uh, AQAP in, in, with which al Awlaki was associated. Um, the, the precise terminology is escaping me, but it was language that has parallels in the ICRC's direct participation in hostilities study, right. talking about in a non-international armed conflict, enemy fighting forces, organized, organized fighting groups, not having um, regular armed force status, but nonetheless being combatants. And I think that it's not an accident that language shows up there, I don't think. And that language, if they're purposefully, is not just there to suggest that they're combatants for targeting purposes, but an idea that this same status entails detention for the duration of hostilities when organized armed groups, which is the phrase, organized armed groups fight in the NIAC. Yeah, exactly. And it, interestingly, the administration just renewed uh, the push to have additional protocol to ratify. We've never ratified additional protocol to, which contains either the limitations or the implicit recognition of uh, the, the lawfulness of detention to non-international armed conflict. But the, I think it was a, week, uh, a month ago, a few weeks ago, the Obama administration asked to have that ratified. So I, I think that sheds a little bit of light on what the position uh, will be moving forward. Yeah. So we're, we're out of time. I will say, if you want further reading on this last point, go find the Red Cross's DPH study and read the initial sections talking about organized armed groups. And you'll get some very interesting insights into the way I think people think about this now. Thank you very much to this wonderful set of panelists for this. Thank you. Discussion.